Let me give you a quick timeline of what actually uh, what actually occurred. And it's been mentioned before, so I'm not going to spend too long on this slide. But if we date back to December 30th, 2019, there was a cluster of cases of pneumonia um, recognized by China's national healthcare system. And they eventually, by January the 7th, this is a quite quick time in terms of infectious diseases, were able to identify uh, this particular virus, which is called novel, meaning it's new. It's not a new virus, it's just new to human beings in terms of infectivity. And quite quickly after that, they had their first fatality in the lab. And by the 13th, this has spread to Thailand. And what did this represent? This clearly represents the challenge that we have with emerging infectious diseases all over the world. And as an infectious disease, disease physician, this is the one of the many that we have. Today, it is a novel coronavirus. Last week, it was Ebola. A year ago, it was NICA. I probably never even heard about that one, right? And I'm telling you, in 2021, in 2022, there will be other viruses that will come, or bacteria that we need to be aware of. The challenge really is with global travel. If you look at this particular slide, it really shows that if you look at the airports for which are directly connected to China, there are many. And therefore, there's a large traffic of people from these areas to China. More interestingly enough, I mean, I, I, every time I put this slide up, it changes. I think as I stand right here, this slide will be different. And it really shows the global impact of this disease. By February the 8th, there were 34,954 cases confirmed, and now we're up to about 725 to 800 cases um, of reported deaths. So what do we know? How can we follow these events? It is important for the public to understand this. So don't follow these events by social media. Yes, they're funny, yes, they're, but follow things that are realistic. So I've given you two key areas. So go to the WHO's website, and they'll give you an up-to-date minute by minute what's going on in terms of the outbreak. Go to the live global um, site which is set up by John Hawkins University. I think this is extremely an excellent site because it, it really puts together more than one areas um, um, to have a, a final idea for you as a public as to what's really going on in a time effective fashion. So what do we know? A lot of what we know as I said before comes off of social media. And a lot of it is really not reality. So how is this transmitted? This is transmitted by droplets and by contact. What does droplets mean? And it's probably important for me as a physician position to explain that to you. It might seem very simple, but it's actually very important. And might take away some of your anxiety. Things which are spread by droplets. If you heard the word droplet, you ask your kid. Droplets, things are spread by droplets. What's the first thing you have to find? What's the first thing you're going to think about if I said droplets? Huh? Sneezing. You say sneezing because we're talking about the virus. If I ask my eight year old son, what do you associate a droplet with? What do you think he would say? Water. Water. There you go. Better. Anything else? Rain. Rain, exactly. So he will you probably say rain. He's not going to say sneezing. He will say rain. So what's the difference between that and something that's airborne? And the public needs to understand the difference. So something that's separate, that is spread by droplets, is something that does not go very far. So it's less than a meter. So and there's a lot of skepticism about, oh, this is airborne. There are two completely different things. Things that are airborne remain suspended in the air and travel much greater distances. Things which are spread by droplets go for very short distances of less than a meter. That is a very important point when it comes to this particular virus. The idea of super spreaders, what does that mean? There have been cases that have identified that you have one particular individual spreading to many other individuals, and that's what's referred to as super spreader. And we're still trying to figure out, you know, the uniqueness in terms of the virus in this particular aspect. Of course, we know the majority of cases have been identified in China, and those initial cases of 41, 44 cases identified initially, they were all admitted to hospital. With similar symptoms of fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, and were even under evaluation. So what else do we know about this virus? There's a lot of their social media which speaks about its homology with HIV and all sorts of different things you hear. But I'm here to 
tell you today that the World Health Organization, quite early, were able to identify the genetics of this particular virus and have really put it in terms of the sequencing to that of SARS, which you have experienced before, but there are strategic differences between this and SARS, which I will mention later. The initial cases, obviously, we thought, certainly, uh, were related to a uh, market in Wuhan, uh, and it's thought to be animal to human acquisition. There have been a rapid amount of cases, as you will see online, social media, in this case, and in this particular virus. And of course, we've documented person-to-person -person, uh, transmission. What else do we know? We know that our own regional agency has really described this as a low-risk event. We know that the CDC in the US has really stopped or avoided all essential travel to China. We know that the World Health Organization has identified this as a global health emergency of public health significance. And we know that there has been interrupted travel to China by many airlines and challenges and shipments to companies. And this really identifies to me something that I think all of you in the room need to think about, about resilience of economies over the world and dependencies of economies over the world on each other. And I think we haven't seen the impact of this yet, but it's going to be very important to see the impact of this, uh, certainly on our economies globally. If you pull something that you have on right now, it's probably going to China. What do we not And there's still a debate about this, whether asymptomatic people can transmit the infection and whether persons before becoming symptomatic can transmit infections. This is really a big talking point. And it really came out of the case of China and a German individual, uh, and we're still in the big debate about that. The frequency of super spread, as I mentioned before, um, is also important. But I think this was mentioned in my the previous slide, so I'm just going to hit on two key points here. Why is it called coronavirus? Because it looks like a problem. It's really something that's really found uh, predominantly in animals, in many animal species, and it's swapped to humans. But the coronavirus in general affects humans, it affects all of you in the room. I can bet you that all of you in the room, 90% of you in the room, have seen the coronavirus. So don't, so run now. Because you hear coronavirus, everybody wants to run. But if I told you that, I'm sure that more than 90% of you in the room have had a common cold and have seen this particular virus. It also presents the gastroenteritis. Why are people so anxious about this? Because it's said to be novel. But if you think about it logistically and logically, SARS is far, a far more challenge to our economies across the globe. It's a far bigger challenge, and I will explain why in the next step. If you compare this to the normal coronavirus which causes the common cold, there's significant differences. And for me, as an infectious disease guy, I am more concerned in terms of this one for one particular aspect, and that is this incubation period. For a normal, this slide shows the normal incubation period for a normal coronavirus which causes you the common cold is somewhere between two to five days. In this particular case, it can extend up to 14 days, and that's quite challenging because you can look pretty well when you harbor this virus and then get sick quite later. And I always tell people the most dangerous virus is the one which you have on you, in you, around you, and it's not causing any trouble, but why it's not causing you trouble is going to other people. But what makes this different? And why am I an infectious disease guy? Yes, I'm concerned. A little less concerned is when we look at the mortality rate. So if you compare this one to many of the other emerging viruses, talk about but remember H1. Everybody in this room remembers H1. When a new virus comes up, you become a virologist. Everybody knows coronavirus, but before that, you never even knew it existed. Right? Nobody ever knew about Ebola. Ebola, everybody knew Ebola. He said, call the word Ebola in the airport, and everybody would run. But there's a significant difference here. Yes, it has a long incubation period, but so far, when we look at statistics and look at patterns, the case fatality rate is so much different than any of the other viruses you see on this slide. In fact, SARS is so much more a fatal disease in terms of case fatality rate, 9.5. Things like MERS, which you probably didn't know much about which was around recently, turned 4.4%. If you think of Ebola, 63%. If you think about this, we talk 
probably somewhere um, um, between, if you look at it in China, about 2% outside of China is actually much less as represented by the CMO. Symptoms. This was mentioned before, but it's always a symptom almost like a common cold. Fever, cough, social, nasal congestion, headaches, myalgia. How many of you in the room have experienced? Is there anybody in the room that has never had one of these? Good. That was a good answer. You put your hand in the right of the room. So this is a, 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 an important slide to demonstrate one particular fact. That represents the other important thing about this virus. If you compare this to your seasonal flu, in terms of the ability of one individual to infect the other, because we're now looking at infectivity, the ability of this particular uh, bug in one person to infect the other, it has a higher infectivity rate. And this is probably why we're seeing those numbers implode. But as I said before, the case looking at the fatality rate of this one, it is so much less than any of those other viruses that we have faced. Okay. And this slide is quite wordy and it's a bit, a bit tricky, and I know for you in the public, you're like, why did you put this slide up? But there's a very important slide to demonstrate two particular facts. One who is affected is affecting the older population, which is a very important point. So far, the data is pushing to a little bit more males than females. I don't know why, but we'll see how that adds out in the numbers of the males that are going to go around. And the other important point here, which I think is strategically important, that people, in terms of the fatalities, are, the rates are much higher in persons who have diabetes, hypertension, all of these comorbidities, so not the average person. And quite interesting, the fatality in kids is not that great at this particular point. I'm sure all of you in the room, if there's one person in this room who has not seen one of these pictures, I will watch you in the door. You want the other slide? You want to go back to the other slide for a minute? He wants you to go back to the other slide for... Right. He uh, just controlled my presentation. This is Jed. This is just me. <laughs> So infection prevention control, like I said, my time is limited. Thank you. Um, so many more interesting things for you to hear. So
and I think my colleagues in the back are going to deal more with this in their presentation, so I'm not going to spend too long on it. I can't emphasize this enough, and I keep telling people, in terms of infectious diseases, one of the most important things, not one of the most, the most important thing is hand washing. And people never get that because they think, oh, this guy always talks about hand washing. Yes, and he will continue to do it. Because we often think we can do all sorts of other things and get around. We can get fancy lights that zap bacteria, we can get the newest curtains with antibacterial, etc. But if you don't get your hand washed together, everything will fall apart. And there are techniques and ways to do it, and this will be discussed later by my colleague. Respiratory hygiene. And notice I have not spoken about anything that you should not be doing in your normal life. You should be washing your hands, correct? You should have good respiratory etiquette, correct? But do you know what that is? My colleagues will go through that with you. And the face masks, they will go through this too, but I just want to highlight two key things. This is going to come as a surprise. We all of them believe, you know, everybody wants to buy a face mask. So they all line up in stores for buying a face mask. But the most important thing to my mind, um, in terms of you're going to use a mask, is you need to know it fits you, is the appropriate mask, and you know to take it on and how to put it on. Masks, in certain circumstances, can be more dangerous than not wearing a mask. And that may sound strange. If you look over many of your social media videos, China, wherever else, you see people have masks on, and this is exactly what they do. They pull it here, they pull it here, if your hands are contaminated, you have just contaminated yourself. It is not just about wearing a mask. This is why we focus on almost all of these infectious diseases on hand hygiene. If we got into trouble and it became a line like hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, respiratory etiquette, covering, you know, covering your mouth when you sneeze, not with your hands, but with tissue, or coughing into the elbow, and proper head uh, House ventilation becomes important. And of course, the national EOC will step in to assist Barbados in getting things if we got to trouble. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak um, and share with you here are my colleagues here, um, which I spent some time with um, less than a week ago, um, discussing the coronavirus in Washington. And to always tell you, this is my mantra for this particular outbreak. It is okay to be anxious, but better to be prepared. Thank you.